Hello, legends and super legends. We're over the home. Getting ready to roll. Paul's already the driver getting ready outside. It's cold this morning. It's about 7C right now. And it will not exceed 14C while we're out there. And since we're going north, it's a lot colder, so I'm wearing two base layers. I got a white and this black. One is sleeveless, one is a regular with sleeves. I got the Velo Harmony arm warmers. I was going to wear the Brevet jersey I had worn on Thursday, but uh, it's not as warm as this jersey. This is Merino wool. It was a limited edition by Rafa. The GB means Gian Battista Baronchelli. He used to ride for the SCIC team. And this is these are the colors. And Rafa just did a spin on it. So it's you know, very unique jersey. And so nice Merino wool jersey. And I have to decide whether I take my neck warmer. I think I will. Because uh, later on I can always pull it off. Let's see here. I don't want the very warm one. And since I'm doing black and white monochrome today, I'm taking this one. If I don't need it, it's easily stored. I'm taking my Belgian wool cap. I don't think I'm gonna need to even flip it up. So if anything, I would just need to remove this neck warmer later on. And the thing I like about it is, those of you who are new, you can pull this off without removing the helmet or anything. The stretch as well. And it's very flexible. You can bring it up and cover your face. I really like that feature about it. So what I'm doing is just gonna zip. This is a three-quarter zip jersey and get this in my neck. It's these little pieces that can increase your warmth. It can either make it too warm or very comfortable on a cold day like today. So just the little pieces to work. I don't have to worry about overheating. I'm going to tack this in. It's got these little things that you pull the pullers on the side because I'm going to load up my pockets. I'm taking my banana bread and some other solids. So the first thing I do is I put my patch kit. I'm taking an extra two, but it's in the back of my Rafa shorts. They've got radio pockets. That's why I keep my phone. So I got two pockets. I put a two in one so I can keep my pocket free. I'm going to drain this as I head out the door and I'm taking one bottle because when it's cold, I don't drink as much. So one bottle will last well over two hours because I don't drink until like two or three hour mark. Since it's a long day, I'm taking four gels because we're going to be out there for maybe five and a half, six hours. I'm putting the gels in here. I've got my banana bread. When, you, when you're going to be on the bike very long, don't just take gels, take some solids. So at the stops, I'm going to eat this. And then I'm gonna take this and this. I got one extra there, I don't think I really need it. So I'm gonna take my granola bar and this other granola bar. I don't know if you notice, I'm putting it up against my body. The gels are outside. My plan is to wear these liners and these gloves. That will just give me flexibility in case I feel warmer, I can always take one or the other off. I don't need the real heavy gloves today. I will be covering my shoes. So. Hope you all get a chance to get some K's in. I'm gonna go ahead and get ready. On this ride, Paul and I left Northampton, headed up to the woodlands to pick up Team RR, see where Doug Shot meets us. We head out on research, took Fish Creek straight out. It was a cold morning, it was a strong northwest wind. We went up Capitol, Raven Chapel, Mo and them connected with us. We were heading out to Richards. When we got to Montgomery, we headed out 149 go through the forest all the way into Richards. You're gonna see us 
drop behind. I stayed with uh, Paul H. He was struggling. We rode into Richards. On the way back, we went on Bethel Road. Got lots of clips for Bethel Road. It's very interesting. To 1097, clips all the way back into Montgomery. So it was a very good ride, very solid. We came back on Keenan Cutoff. By that time, we're pretty much out of battery power. Use Honia Egypt, the road has cleared, the water left the road, and so we're able to use our favorite road back. I hope you all will enjoy the clips. There's a lot of teaching moments in there. You can see where Paul and I cut through the neighborhood. We wanted to make sure we got 162 plus kilometers. Hope you got your K's in. It's cold. Look at Rudy. Rudy's cold. <laughs> There's Mark coming to give me a fist pump. There's Scott over there with the white vest. No, that's fine. Just ride. You don't want to restrict anybody. I mean, you do what they want. You don't have to follow. Going a little bit longer. Let's try. Yeah. Mark was saying that she would restrict people, and I told him no. Let them do whatever they want. Because we're doing. They're doing about almost um, All right. How are you, man? 80 miles on this ride. So that's four oh, yeah. hours plus. And you know, he was saying, do we restrict <laughs> people? So let them do what they want. They'll pay the price if yeah, they don't pace right. themselves. So, you know. <laughs> are you gonna try to go long or short? Uh, Paul's asking Rick and you know, Rick, I don't know. I guess it's not cold enough for Rick. It is cold. You see, it says 4C. It feels like 2C because we have a northern flow of air. I am wearing the heaviest stuff I had. Those of you who saw the prologue, of course, if you're watching this, you didn't skip. Uh, if you didn't skip, you saw. I'm wearing two base layers and a woolen jersey. That jersey, I can, I don't wear it in the summer. It's warm. So you're gonna it's, go it's fairly breathable, but it's warm. Paul keeps asking Rick whether he's going long or not. I'm not sure. I guess he didn't get the correct answer the first time. Rick, Rick has a way of, instead of saying yes or no, he talks like a politician. I mean, look at what he's wearing. It's cold. So when you dress like that, later on in life, when you start having arthritis of the knees, think back to what you did. Because that's, that's just, he's the only one dressed like that. We're not wearing this stuff that we're wearing because of, it's just a fashion statement. It is cold. I got Randy two gloves on. Oh, really? <laughs> I just told Paul that uh, Randy signed up on Patreon to support the channel. So Randy is our newest super legend. He's up the road at a park, uh, shopping center. We're going to pick him up. Uh, but those of you who remember, Randy was underdressed the last time it was cold. In a little while, you, you will hear me suggest to Rick that why don't you use the road is available because you will see him come across uh, some debris and also that shoulder they're on is not for driving or riding there's there are curbs that jut out at every intersection you will see right there as we approach that intersection the curb from that road pretty much blocks what they're in see Mike had to come over he's got to come over So I think, I don't know if it was there that I suggested it here. I haven't suggested it yet. But you see now Mike is using the road because the lane ends again. Now watch. So I just told him, come on the road, buddy. We've got this lane. I said, you know, don't risk having a flat. He said, oh, I haven't had a flat on these, on these tires yet. <laughs> so he said, you know, knock on wood. I just said I haven't had a flat, and chances are I'm going to have a flat and cause you guys to wait. And that's what you heard me say. I'm not waiting for anybody. It's too cold. And I meant it. Uh, this week on this ride, you'll see we come across Mo. I put this on here so you can see. I don't even think about it, guys. This is how I breathe on the bike. Look at my stomach. I belly breathe. 
I take in a lot of oxygen. I don't even have to think about it. Some years of practice. But what I was saying is that we're going to come across Mo and riding with Mo today. We rode with him. They're going to Richards also. We didn't know. The Woodlands That's race team. The and we come across them. <laughs> and so Mo said cycling time is precious. We're talking about all kinds of stuff. And that re resonated with me because that's how I feel. If I've got four hours to ride, I want to ride four hours. It's not possible because you got to, you know, lights and other things. So we try to keep our moving time close to the elapsed time. I want to be riding most of the time I'm out there, not sitting around waiting for people who did not maintain their bikes, did not air up the tires. I don't have time for that. So that's why I told Rick, you know, you have a flat. After I've suggested come use the road, avoid having a flat. Oh, I've never had a flat. He's still riding over there. Well, I haven't had a flat on these tires. You have a flat? I thought it's too cold. You're on your own. You know, I'm going to keep rolling. And that's the way you have to look at it. That's the headache with groups. Uh, they have their positives, but a lot of times people come with problems that they could have dealt with. And then they slow you down. At this point, we're sitting at 1488. We're going across here. There's a shopping center. There's a Kroger shopping center. We're going to go pick up Randy, out the newest super legend of the channel. Randy and uh, Jamal Griffin yes, signed up a couple of days ago this week. I had them on the lettering of the last video that I made about the saddle breaking. This is the ride it happened on. That's why I'm telling Scott, Randy, he said we're picking up Randy. I said, Randy's a you super legend, okay? we'll have to pick him up here. <laughs> There's our newest super legend, uh -oh. Randy Keir. Randy joined our community last night. Oh, we did? Yeah, super legend Randy. I'm gonna turn around and get him on camera. <laughs> I just got a notice from the thing that Reggie, uh, Randy, hey Paul. I got a notice last night, man. Welcome, super legend. <laughs> Look at him. You ready? You like those heat warmers? Look at this guy. Come on, man. You got a rep to protect. What is that? What is that? Duct tape. What do they call that? GCM? Is it a bodge or a hack? <laughs> hey, po people are po ways. <laughs> Randy's hey, got works, duct tape on his shoes to stay yeah, warm. Probably be okay even without that. It's nice. It's supposed to warm up. That's funny. I've never. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 not gonna be that bad. It's supposed to warm up. This guy has duct tape on his Hey, whatever extends the life. That's the only thing I've duct tape. Oh, let's not get into that. This is a family channel. <laughs> <laughs> so we roll up to the Kroger over there, Mary's, uh, there's a Christmas party they're having this evening, the evening of after this ride. Uh, Paul and I were not, were not able to make it to the party, but... Seven, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so we're, we're picking up Mary here. 17 miles Yeah, well that's Victor, up to you guys. Under 18. Mike is saying, oh we need to All keep day. the speeds governed because we, we're doing uh, about 128. That's Mary. So that's what we're waiting for. Ready to go. She's just gonna stay with us for a little while. She's doing a shorter ride because she's got that party to, to deal with. She's planning a party, a Christmas party. So we head out. All these little rocks, I hate them. You need to stand when you go through those. They can uh, they can cause pinch flats. If you hit them the right way. So just be aware. Don't load your tires too much. Not sure where they come from. People have to buy those rocks. They must have built something there and just didn't clean up. But we're headed north on Fish Creek. I'm looking for Paul. You will see me look behind. I want to see where he is. We're out. We we confirmed that the cold weather does affect the performance of the gimbal. That's why we get these Dutch angles and all that kind of stuff. And uh, once it warms up above 10 C, then the gimbal is happy. <laughs> so, so the gimbal needs a coat. Maybe I'll get a skin suit for the gimbal or something. Of course, it's not documented by remote. I don't think they're aware of it or chose not to. It doesn't matter. We're on the bike, we're moving, it's a lot colder. If you feel your stem on a day like this, bare hands, it's cold. 
the bicycle step, and air gets to it. And I think the body of the removal gets cold. It's alloy. Once again, of course, I am using the road. I'm not riding in all that debris on the right. I think I'm sitting next to Paul, we're just kind of chatting. We haven't really started riding, we're just kind of rolling out. At this point, my hands are a little nippy. Not, I don't comfortably cold, but you know, they feel fine. I like what I have on. And I'll bomb or anything. Late in the ride, on the way back, when, when it was just Paul and I, I took my gloves off. They warmed up enough. So since the, the ride was posted as 128 kilometers, which is about almost 80 miles, the, the, the plan was when they posted it, oh, we're going to ride steady, you know, keep the pace steady or whatever. Of course, you guys have heard that. Those of you who have been riding for any appreciable time, don't buy that. They say one thing and you get with the group and it changes. And you guys heard us in the parking lot. I told Mark, I said, don't restrict anybody. Let them do what they want. And you guys will see. I've got good clips that shows that. And uh, later in the ride, I'm going to be highlighting Scott and the things. He's not the only one that does that, but the things that people do when they get dropped sometime or after they get dropped, they come and make a hard effort once you wait for them. And then you wonder, well, why did you allow yourself to get dropped if you can come and pull now? So those are the kind of things that just put a, it puzzles me because that's not the way I was trained in cycling. I was trained to conserve and use your energy to stay with the group. And so I don't really understand what they're doing and that's what I'm going to walk you all through here, kind of point out what you don't want to do. I, I thought that it would be a great teaching exercise. So as we head up uh, Fish Creek here, the pace is picking up a little bit. Nothing crazy. You can tell by my cadence we're not really riding. My heart rate's like 120. That's low zone one for me. I try to stay near Paul as much as possible when he's filming because I need to see myself on the film somewhere so that I can synchronize the film on the map when I'm doing the interactive stuff with my head unit to get those metrics correct. Of course, our, our coach, the wind, is out here as usual. The waters have since receded. All the roads are clear. We end up coming back on Ponya, Egypt, the one that was like a lake. We did not film that. At that point, we were out of battery power. The SD car I have will take a lot, but I don't want to film anything longer than two and a half hours. It's just too, it's just too much to go through. Plus, the battery will last about that long. I mean, we have a spare battery, but I really don't want to have too much footage. And sometimes it's hard to choose what to get rid of. And I want the story to be continuous. That's what makes these rides work. I'm in the middle gear back there, probably a 17, and on the big chain ring was 53 on this bike. And I can see right here, the saddle's not broken. I mean, it was close enough to where I could tell. So I don't really know where it happened. Uh, I never felt any difference in my saddle the entire time, which is a tribute to this, the quality of this. I've broken saddles in the past where I had to stand the rest of the ride or call for a ride or basically stop. If you're in a race, stop the race. You can't put weight on it. I used to ride the, there was a saddle called Flight back in the day. Vassella Italia. It was excellent, but uh, they had independent rails. And someone mentioned on the channel that the rails on the SMP is one unit. And, and another positive is because there's one unit, it has a loop in the back. That's why I'm able to put my light around that loop. 
and that's where you see the tail light is. So all of that just made me fall even more in love with the SMP. I've never broken a saddle and been able to ride and not even know it was broken. So you know, it had a lot of kilometers on it, about 20,000. On their site, they say 24 months or 15,000 kilometers, whichever comes first. That's what their, their so-called warranty is. 24 months, that's two years, that's not very long. But I guess if it breaks in that period, then the quality is in question. And as saddles go, as long as you're clamping along the allowable space on the rails, you're fine. It doesn't need to be directly in the middle. This saddle was fairly close to being in the middle, maybe slightly back, and it broke. It, it did not even break where it was clamped. It broke behind the clamp. So that's just fatigue. The way it is used, the bumps, the kind of riding you do, all of that. You know, you think about it, your reels are your suspension in a way, besides the geometry of your frame. So I was very, very impressed. You know, because I'm real picky. I can feel anything off of my saddle, I can tell. Not a problem, we rode hard. So it broke during this ride somewhere. So I'm definitely sold. Break a saddle, be able to ride, not even know, get home. I would have ridden the next day, not even be aware. You hear the wind. We're doing 33 kilometers an hour. The road has kind of leveled off. And uh, there's a light over there. I think it's going to turn green before we get to it. So we end up just rolling through it. This is Neville here in front of me. He and I were wearing black and white today. We laughed about it. He said, I kind of knew what you were going to, I got a feeling you were going to wear black and white, so I wore black and white. We're, we're trying to get the gimbal to change its position of the camera because of the cold, the cold temperatures. And I'm just kind of getting into a rhythm here and just standing and riding up to the boards. Paul and I have been putting in a lot of kilometers the last few weeks, so our fitness have gone up even more than where it used to be. In a few, well not a few, in probably 10 kilometers, we will, Mo and his group, the racing team, will pass us. They have a different start area they start from, and it, it, it turns out they were headed to Richards. So we end up merging the groups later. So this supposedly steady ride was not steady at all. So what else is new? It didn't matter to me. I already have a plan. So the jackrabbits can do what they want, it doesn't matter. You heard Paul ask Rick several times, are you going long? He had a million ways of not answering yes. <laughs> Felt like we're in Washington, D.C. <laughs> All you gotta do is say yes or no. You know? <laughs> I edited those out because it just was you know, it, it was just too much talk. I hate when people talk and don't say anything. And so because he knows he doesn't have the fitness to do the distance, um, and the rest of the group have a plan because this ride was planned, we know what we're doing. And, and they know his history of killing himself and not being able to sustain it. So nobody really goes with him you will see in a little while, I think he's near the front. He will ride off and just be up the front there. And we just left him out there. <laughs> and that's what you have to do. You have to have your own plan. And the group doesn't conform, you ride along. The bicycle has one seat. You don't really need company. 
get on your bike and just go. That's the joy of it. And there are times when it's just nice to just head out. There are times Paul and I just go out and do our own thing. We went out on Sunday, we were heading out. We left a little later from the house and we ended up catching up to part of the group. That's Mary back there. Mary's got some monster gloves on. They're huge. She's trying to keep her hands warm. That's Scott pulling off. You see how high Scott sits? And you see how his bike has an S? That says he's, he's not uh, fitted for his saddle. He's not controlling the motion of the bike with his hips. The bike, like, it kind of tracks on its own. And Scott is the one I'm going to highlight later in the ride that does something that just confused me because it was inconsistent with what he showed. And you'll see when we get there. Simon Moses made a comment about Michael's socks, his orange socks. He's got it pulled way up here. And he's got red shoe covers, I guess. Red or pink, it's hard to tell. At this point in the ride, I am dressed correctly, with my neck warmers in place. Everything feels right. Those shorts I'm wearing are made by Rafa. They're the thermal shorts. They're not regular shorts. Protein thermal shorts. They have fleece on the inside, the entire inside. Nice and warm. So there are differences. Or standing in the parking lot and what Rudy was wearing, it's not really for very cold weather. It's very light stuff. And you see that wool jersey. We're going into the wind. You can see a little flicker below the pocket. It's got the same styling like the pro team. When you put stuff in the pocket, it's up. You know, this is the reason I like the Rafa stuff. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. I'm wearing a wool jersey that fits my body like it's polyester. You don't have to give up fit because the material's different. It's got a number on the back of the jersey. It's hard to see, probably. I think it's 132. That was the number for Gian Battista Baronkelli. One of his rides. I have another jersey for that, uh, that in memory of the rides of Felice Gimondi. I wear that another, on another cold day. So Rafa makes these tributes. These limited edition jerseys for the, the greats of the golden years of cycling. And unless you know your history, nobody on this ride knew what that jersey meant other than Paul. And that's cool. So Gian Battista Baronkelli was an awesome racer in his day. He had a total of 94 victories. He was born in Ceresara in the province of Mantua in Italy. He won the Tour de la Avenir, the race of the future, and the baby Giro. And they had hopes that he was going to win the Giro d'Italia. And he was nicknamed Gibi, G-I-B-I. -I. That's what they called him. They took his name, Jim Battista, and they took Baron Kelly, the B from the last name, and the fact that it ended in an I. So the G-I from his first name and the first letter of his last name and the last letter of his last name, that's what made GB. So that was his nickname. And so unless you knew that, if you see that jersey, it would mean nothing to you. The jersey represents the team colors of the SCIC team that he raced for. So when you see the SCIC jersey, it looks exactly like what I'm wearing. Other than they put GB on this one and they put some badges on the arms. It's really colorful, the Italian styling, the flag. This, the history of our sport is very rich. I will be returning to our history uh, videos soon to do more of our, our former champions. But when you hear Gian Battista Baron Kelly, 
they should give you goose pimples because these boys, there were no power meters, heart rate monitors. They just put their heads down, put it in the gear, got in the drops, and just rode. So at this point, the pace for me feels a little above endurance. Um, not a problem. Uh, we're, just, we're actually not riding very hard, which is good. It's steady at this point. So we're right on schedule. You can even hear people in the back having a conversation. You see where my tires are? To the left of the white line. It's the cleanest part of the lane. I'm not gonna relegate myself to that shoulder with all these little rocks on there. There's no reason to. We need to use this lane so the drivers can pass in the other lane. As big as this group is, we should take the entire lane until the road get really narrow. So you can see the saddle is still intact. So it must have broken on the way back. <laughs> I don't know, we rode a lot of climbs. This was a hard ride. These boys ride six hours. We're hooked up with the Woodland Racing Team. You'll see them come by. And they ride six hours like it's two or three. They just ride the same way and just go longer. And that's, that's how you build speed and endurance. They don't back off much. Paul was on good form today, Paul Ilonka rode really well, he looked very smooth, he's not having any more challenges with his knee, I think the mileage we've been doing made a difference, listen to the wind, the wind's always here, that's what we dress for, you can't just dress when you, for when you're standing in your backyard or whatever, you have to know that you're going to be moving, 22 miles an hour thereabouts, you, you're generating some wind chill, it's not like walking, or even run it. So I feel for those that don't have a good fit. It's hard to ride six hours in an uncomfortable bike on an uncomfortable bicycle. It's just hard. Get home, everything hurts. And then you have to deal with saddle swords and all that. I had to deal with that early in my cycling. And I immediately got into trying to el eliminate the problems. That's really how I got into fit. Because back then, all they were pushing was fit kit. Paid for it. It was a waste of money. Everything was wrong. Put, I put my cleats over the axle. Knee over pedal axle. Never worked for me. It was uncomfortable. Before I even left the shop, I told him, no, this is not going to work. We ended up moving. So I'm not, I'm not a knee over pedal axle guy. Maybe some of you may happen to be, but I'm about one and a half centimeters behind the axle. That's where my body wants that bad point. It puts it a little behind the center of the ball of my foot. So my levers can work. If you watch my feet, you can see me pulling up. I don't think about it. It's automatic now. I've been riding long enough. Now watch. I'm pulling up, so watch. I'm, I'm not riding any harder. They're slowing down. I want to illustrate that. I did not change my speed. They went slower. That's why I'm standing here. to just got to change my motion. You see, Victor takes off like he usually does. Of course, everybody ignores it. Anybody who got sense, you know, we're not going to waste our energy on that. That's, he's going nowhere. So I, it, it slowed down so I moved left so I wouldn't lose my momentum. On the climb, when you slow down, it's inefficient. So I just sit here to see what they're doing. I think Rick is up the road. He hasn't learned yet, <laughs> but he doesn't have a plan. So he's not part of our plan. We just, we don't pay attention. 
the overpass is coming and I'm just watching to see if the guys like I see Paul H up there and that's Bob behind Paul I don't know if Bob intended to do the whole ride or not probably not I don't believe he's got the fitness for that distance but uh, he was riding really well here I think he needs more cycling specific clothing but those things he's wearing they don't look like cycling tights and if you don't wear cycling stuff they move on you so i'm just riding same effort and paul h is in my way so i move left i use my ears i'm listening for cars even though i didn't look behind i've, I've been paying attention so i just move around him and i kept the effort the same see my heart rate went up like three beats I'm not going any harder. I'm not thinking about those guys up there. All I'm doing is keeping the group together. And I just want to ride the climb and not lose my rhythm. And this is Neville behind me and Paul is behind Neville. You see where I plant my tire? I'm right pretty much on the line. I move a little over and I'll come back. I'm staying out of the debris. I know there are no cars coming. So I stay there. This bridge is only two lanes, so yes, we try to use the right side as much as possible. I wish they, they get the sweeper out here to clean this stuff they have on the right. It's too much stuff. That's why you don't waste your energy. Those guys that went up there to ride up in front of us. You can see the group broke up on the climb. And I was just riding, I did not go hard. You know what I mean, as far as I, I know. I mean, I, I was not going hard, same effort. And I, I'm keeping the effort the same here. So as we descended, I just shifted up a few columns. And so you see we're doing 31 kilometers an hour thereabouts. We're going directly into the wind. This lane, this shoulder ends. I look behind for cars and I move over. See where I'm riding, that's where you're supposed to ride when you ride solo. Take the road because it forces them to pass you by going over the yellow line as opposed to squeezing by your elbow. There are some of them that may blow at you. All you want to do is look back, make sure it's not an emergency. Just look back to see what the, the horn blowing is for because if you're in danger, yeah, you want to get out of the way. I usually just look. If it's just somebody being a jerk, I, I maintain my position and keep riding. And sometimes if it's safe, I just wave them over and tell them, pass. I'm not, I'm not leaving the road. Because a lot of them are ignorant, they don't know. We have a lot of information in the world and people don't take advantage of getting familiar with it. That's not my problem or your problem. You just make the best out of the situation. I think in a little while here, Rick jumps in the dirt. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, right there. I'm like, whatever. You ain't gonna see me riding my baby over there. Unless I had a gravel bike, I ain't going over there. So when he comes back, I just ignored him and kept riding. Uh, my bike handling is at the point where if you bump me, you better be balanced because I know how to keep my bike upright. I spend enough time mountain biking. Those of you who mountain bike, you know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not going down if you bump me. I know how to handle my bike. So I wasn't even worried about that stuff he was doing. I don't know what that was about. That, that's what I said earlier to him. You have a flat, I'm not waiting for you. <laughs> you know? So if somebody does something like that and has a flat, who, who, I'm going to take my Saturday morning away. You're going to be standing by the side of the road. Then you'll learn. I'm still riding. I don't know what they're doing. You look at my heart rate. Same area. Same pressure. Same zone. Watch. I haven't changed anything. That's what I'm talking about. Pacing. I can do this all day. <laughs> Wait, Mark. Mark wants nothing to do with the front. <laughs> I waved him by. He, he, he doesn't want to go. And I maintained my pressure. Look, my heart rate went down a little bit. I just kept the pace the same and I ended up back at the front. Nobody wants to go to the front. I just keep riding. That's what I'm talking about. Pace yourself. It did 
didn't matter to me what they were doing, but I know I can do this all day. So I just decided I would hold this pace. So everybody, you saw we passed Victor, we, we passed Rick, all of them that were doing all that stuff, we passed them. We didn't have to waste our energy. Now watch, when we go down the hill here, I'm still keeping the, the effort the same. My heart rate's dropping, I can tell it's getting easier. I don't really look at my heart rate when I'm riding because where I have it way down, I don't have it near where it's, it, I keep my cadence at the top. That's what I look at. So that's all I'm looking at is my cadence to make sure that I'm efficient. The road starts to go up here. You can see my heart rate had dropped. So I'm putting pressure to the pedals to return to the same effort. And Mark thinks I'm racing him, so he starts racing. Now watch, I'm not gonna say anything else you'll see. I will just prompt, I will just prompt you guys. So every time he changes the pace, I edge it up a little bit. So we're riding side by side, right there, I'm just edging. Now I've got the effort where it was before 157 thereabouts. Because we're climbing, my heart rate starts to go up. I don't care about that. I don't even look at that thing. I can't see it, really. I'm just riding. I'm listening to my legs. And my legs are happy with the gear I'm in. You can see my cadence. So as it gets steeper there, I just ride away. I'm not change I did not change the effort that much. But my heart rate went up because I was keeping my cadence high on a hill. We're turning right here. I don't want to stop. I check for cars. This is Raven Chapel Road, and it, it's a drag. It's a what that one of our legends called it Ninja Gray. <laughs> and and you see, we're we're off the front without trying. So all I'm doing is I'm just riding. I back off a bit because I see Paul there, so he can come off, and I just continue riding. So the same effort from the overpass to here, the group has spread out because they don't gauge they don't gave themselves they let a lot of gaps open back there so they have to work very hard and I just keep rolling in a, in a, in a little while more will come by because they're they're coming from a different direction and they're coming on the same road they're going to the same place we're growing so I see Paul once I see Paul's in the draft I just resume with the effort you can see 153 is what it says I'm doing all of this by feel. I go back to just keeping the effort. You need to really rely on that because like one of the guys I'm coaching, uh, Daniel, he just sent me an email this morning before I started the narration. He said he was giving me an update for his week. And he said he had very little sleep, but he felt great on the ride. He had a good long ride, you know, so he's getting into his own when it comes to that. But he had a very good ride. And so he told me that his only issue was the parameter quit. And that's my thing with someone, I don't know, I think he has stages. And so here's the thing, why would this guy go and invest in more power meters if these people are selling us products that when, when you want to use this product you spend your money for, it just doesn't work. You know, that's another reason I don't want electronic shifting. I don't want batteries anywhere near my shifting. I got enough stuff on the bike, like the computer to deal with, you know, so it's like, they come up with these new things, they don't test them very well, they don't test them in a different situation, and that's why we're having all these problems. That's Mo. That's Mo. That's the that's Mo uh, with the Woodlands Racers, Woodlands Cycling Club. So he said hi, I greeted him, and he asked where we're going, and we told him Richards. And that's uh, uh, what Victor's trying to keep up with Mo. Now, Mo is just crazy fast. Most of the guy I was telling you all about that uh, used to ride with uh, Mario Cipollini of the Saeco team. He got most from Italy and they know each other. They've ridden together. They've chewed the same dirt, let's put it that way. Yeah, Rick, well, I don't know, I guess he was being funny. He said, oh, why did you guys move? Go ahead, guy, go ahead, guy. So Paul is educating him. That that's a different group. We got our own plan. That, those are the, the Woodland Cycling Club guys. They're going to Richards also. And this guy rides with them. He's off the back. Um, I forgot his name, but I know him. He's a nice fellow. 
greeted us as he went by. And this is Will. That's one of the heavy hitters in that group. And on this ride, I sat on that guy's wheel to see just how hard they were going. We ended up in a breakaway, he and I, and I had no idea we were in a breakaway. I thought there were people behind me. So when I turned around, there was nobody that he and I were off the front on 149. We don't have the, we didn't have the camera on, unfortunately. But I was like, what am I doing up here? I didn't plan on going this hard. You know, my heart rate was like top of zone four, which, you know, I can do. But I was like, man, this is not the plan. I did not realize I had stayed on his wheel that long to where everybody else had fallen off. Because uh, about six months ago when I hooked up with those guys that day, we did the warm up. Um, I don't think I filmed that ride. I think it was the ride, the ride before the warm up. I rode with them and I brought that to the channel. And that guy was constantly riding off the front. So today what I wanted to see was, okay, let me see how hard this guy is going when he's off the front. But I thought that we were just, he was just pulling, because he was pulling so hard, because Doug who was behind me here had pulled. And then Will took over, he was behind Doug, I was behind Will, and I was about an inch off his wheel. And Will's a small guy, so I don't get a great draft. My bike gets a draft, but not my body. So I was low and just focusing on his wheel. And we're just riding so hard and so when i when i turned around and realized there was nobody that had already pulled out of his draft and i was like man I, I didn't realize we're in a break i should have stayed there but it was just so fast for the ride that we we're doing and he did back off after a while but the group was spread out all over 149 and then Moore was doing his shepherding job going back and bringing people up that's what Moore does because it gives him more of a workout and he can still stay with the group instead of riding away from us so right here, these guys pass me, and all I do is, I pick up the pace just a little. If you watch, I went from 22 to 25. They didn't make that much progress. And so all I do is keep them within reach, and I realize they're not going anywhere. So you have to resist the urge to jump, you know, uh, accelerate too quickly, because it makes your heart rate spike. I'm, I'm riding up to them after they pass me, and I'm not even at sweet spot because of how I'm using my effort. That's what I'm trying to stress. You don't need to get excited. They're right there. Even with the wide angle of the camera, you can tell they're right there. So stay on the control. Know that people are not going anywhere. And if you're gonna pick it up, especially on a long ride, you don't need to get excited. You're, in a few kilometers, you will see we'll, we'll do a sprint. Because Victor starts a sprint up a hill using a huge gear and I pass all of them spinning like 114 which is not the fastest I can spin but it's what I needed to for that hill with the gear I was in. Then when the sprint was, was over then Rick passes on the right. So it became clear to me that Rick is uh, fairly new at I guess organized riding. Mike came on my right and I, he hit his brakes and I heard him. I, I thought he wanted to come by, so I waved him. Then he asked what I would turn, and that's why you see me point. Now, right here, I'm gonna bug uh, Mark and them because remember they passed me on the hill. What they do is they'll pass you on the climb, and then they want to slide back here now, so you can pull the group. And you will hear me say, "No sliding back." You pass me on the hill, pull the group for a while. Right there, you see Mark, he's very good at this. He's trying to slide back so he can sit behind us. No, you pass on the hill, get up there. That's just what I told him. And we're laughing about it. It's like, if you're gonna sit in a draft and somebody pulls you, then you want to attack them. Why should they pull again? That's the stuff these guys don't understand. And you know, these are just nuances of our sport. The same thing happened on Sunday when we rode, when Paul and I was riding with them. I was going to the front to give a wheel to another rider. One other rider who I won't name here gets on my wheel and the road starts to go up and he's, he attacks in a baby gear and he's spinning like a hamster going nowhere, which changes the speed a little bit enough to where the weaker riders got dropped while I was trying to hold the group. When we finally, after maybe three or four kilometers of that, we stopped at a corner and the, the, the Rico riders were chastising him. <laughs> so it was it was fun, it was amusing to, to, to hear. They were like, they were thanking me for coming and pulling because 
I kept it at a pace that everybody could handle. And then they told him, hey, you had to go to the front. <laughs> so we laughed about it, you know. But it's just, the, the point I'm trying to make is a lot of people ride, but they don't really understand all the little dynamics of the sport. I don't know what Nick, I mean Rick is wearing. Uh, <laughs> those colors, man. I know I wear some wild stuff, but he's got me beat. He said he was going to wear lime green as well over his uh, black uh, shirt, I guess. I don't know. He said it in the parking lot. So he's aware of what he's wearing. It looks like checkered pants. So now more of them are off the road. They are they're on mail route. I think they're up there. You probably see that lights flashing. Probably some of the guys right up there. They're not too far ahead, right? There you see the lights flashing. Because we're you know we're right on an okay pace. You can see them. They're gonna turn left. There they are. And from time to time, Paul and I will ride with more of them. It's nice to have that option. So um, we turn here too, and I think yeah, Paul has the camera. I think Mark is behind Paul, and I'm behind Mark. You can see Paul's shadow. In a little while, right up to him, and I adjust the camera angle because it looked like it was filming too low. It was having all kinds of challenges. This is Mark coming around Paul. And I think I end up riding up. I think that's me. I don't need a mark. Mark the top on the left. But right here, everybody starts getting excited because this mill route has a lot of ups and downs. So the pace gets hard. I think that's Victor on the left there. Yeah. always rides on the and you start like in the opposite yeah that, that's me adjusting the camera for Paul it was just too far down but tell him Victor this car back so he can close it up because he's all the way on the other side of the road I downshift as the road goes up and I kick up my cadence water down there. Doesn't take much water to dirty your bike. I hate that. Dry day like this. Especially if my buddy Paul has a white Cervelo he's riding today. It shows everything. The ride of the road starts to go up. You can see Mark rocking. camera's at an extreme angle because it's having challenges with these temperatures. Paul spins it around and corrects it. I think he's going to manually bring it down because now he's pointed up. He spins it around one more time. Then I think you would see him bring it down right there. So Paul manually adjusted the camera. So here he is. We're riding hard. He's doing all this stuff instead of just writing. So it's not easy when we film. And I'm always watching for that. You can see I'm putting power to the pedal here. And I anchor myself in the saddle and just let my legs go. Right here, I move up in front of Scott. He's just in the way. These boys are moving. He's not even closing the gap. And I use cadence to do that. He's muscling a big gear. He was going slower and slower. That's why you need to work on leg speed. That's where they come to play. When, you, when you're trying to hold your position in the group or gain position, whether you do a criterion or whatever, it's leg speed to keep you up there. The guys at the front are working hard. That's why they're there. So 
not easy to be at the front. A bit of a gap here. I think Paul's gonna come and close it. So now, there's the climb up there. You can see lights. Those guys are, some of them stop. You see them in a little while to stop for a, a nature break. Cause it's quiet back on this road. That's what Paul and I, we stop in quiet places because I don't like to go to stores unless I have to. We take what we need, we just ride. Right here, Victor starts to sprint. That same stuff he does, and I just turn on the gas. You can see that. That's when you go. This is the steep pitch. 1%, it kicks up. You can see it. And I'm done. The sprint's over. Then the road flattens out. Then Rick goes. <laughs> and then you'll see Victor come on my left. It's easy now, so yeah. So these guys are taking a nature break here. The highway is right up the road. We're going downhill. But you make your move when it's hard. Go when it's going up. That's when everybody has to work. So we're just messing around. You know, it doesn't matter that we're doing 128 kilometers with them and then 40 something more by ourselves. I felt good. I went ahead and just revved up my gear. That duck shot there. I'm just sitting with Paul here. He's rolling to the corner. I think we end up, that's Jerry. I don't know this guy's name. I'm gonna have to get their names. We're gonna start riding with them from time to time. That's Will, the guy in the pink over there, and then uh, you guys know Mo. So we just rolled it, he'll catch back up. We turn here on this highway. I think Paul ends up giving me the camera in a little bit. Because the, the, the latter part of the ride, I do most of the film. So yeah, it's not easy dealing with a camera and riding but we do enough work to where we can do it. So we're carrying a camera that weighs close to one pound. We're riding. This is Bethel Road southbound. We have left Richards and we're headed back south. The Woodlands Club guys are up the road a little bit. This is our group here on Bethel Road. And this road is very quiet, it cuts through the forest, and it has a lot of climbs. You will see in a little while why you need to be in the proper gear to climb. Because without that, you just, you make, biomechanically, you shortchange yourself. You will see it. So I've got the camera here. It's still a little finicky because it's still cool in here. You can see it says 9C. So once it gets above 10C, all of a sudden the camera just looks perfect. So we're still learning what's going on with it because it didn't document a whole lot of restrictions on when you can use it. See me spinning it around. When you spin it around, it tries to recalibrate. But the cold weather really, I think, is the culprit. I think they tested it probably at 20 C and above. This is Rudy here. Rudy was very cold early in the ride because the stuff he's wearing, it's not for very cold weather. The fabrics are too light. Need something warmer. I don't play with the weather. I hate getting sick. It's just such a waste of time. So I, I don't play with it. I respect the weather. I don't play with the weather. I don't mess with mosquitoes. I hate those things. They bite. You get you can get illness from them. So I don't I don't play with those things. In the summer we get a lot of mosquitoes because we have a lot of standing water in certain places. But my fellow Houstonians don't respect the weather. They depend on their car. They dress really light for the weather to jump in the cars and run to the store and run in and out of buildings and they think that's enough. So, people up north, people in the real cold parts of the US, 
I, I, you know, I used to live in New York, the New York area for a little while, and they carry blankets and flares and, you know, there's all kinds, they don't play because you, you end up getting stuck in the snow, that's serious business. You come down here, these guys don't even want to wear a windbreaker. I always just smile. <laughs> so that's Doug Shot riding off the front there, you know, nobody's staying on his wheel. I'm just sitting back here to, to film everybody, because this road, we're going up right now. This is not the steepest pitch. We'll come across it and you will see what I'm talking about. So the, this is Bethel Road is up and down. The road's up and down, so I don't need to really be in the draft. I'm just kind of hanging off the back a little bit. Making sure I get this camera nice square to where right here. back up closer to the guys. Doug's still hanging a little off the front there. Mike is up there. Looks like, uh, let's see, I don't know who's in front of Mike. Mark is behind him. It's Victor. Victor's in front of Mike. The riding up to Doug. Oh, he's probably just looking to see where I was. I'm just coasting. I mean, we're going downhill. When you come north on this road, this is a very nice long climb that we're going down. So you always want to mix up your routes. The descents will become your climbs. It's nice to go reverse. Don't do the same direction on your routes all the time. Change them around. It's a different experience. The road starts to kick up here. You can see what Neville's riding. He's on the big, big ring and it's hard to know whether he's, I mean, I don't know what kind of cassettes he's carrying. It might be a 19 or something less than that. Paul has a 50 on his bike. He's got a compact chain set. See this climb is hard and long. Look at it going up and going to the left. We're climbing, I adjust the camera here. And then I notice everybody's just going slower. I'm just riding because I'm in the right gear. I mean like a 55 inch gear. And they're over geared, you can see them. I ride past them without trying. I'm only doing 19 kilometers an hour. But they're in the wrong gear. I wasn't planning on passing, I just didn't want to slow down. That's like a 7% climb. It's not going to register. It says 6. It's 7%. 7.2. All I want to do is get over that thing. Then I turn the camera around once I get over and I try to catch my breath. So try not to stop on a climb. It's harder to get started. That's why you see in the pro tours, the, the spectators will push the guys. That's what I was talking about. They were in the wrong gears. Everybody was on the big chain ring and they just ran out of ratios. And so they had to strain. In a few kilometers, we'll, we'll come across Mo. He's riding, he rode back for us and he's circling and so forth to pull us back to his group. Because what they would do is they would do what they normally do and then he would come back and pull us back and pull us back to kind of keep the, the group together. He, I guess he wanted, since there's a lot of riders out here going to Richards, it was better than having maybe three or five riders in his group. Because not his entire group goes all the way to Richards. So there's safety in numbers, so he wants to kind of keep everybody together. And plus it gives him a workout. He's riding back over the course turns around and pulls us back so he's working twice as hard the wind on that little descent it goes back up again it's not as steep as the other one it might be maybe one to two percent 
it's not registering, I'm not sure why, but it, it's going on. This is Scott here in front of me. I don't drive real closely when the road's up and down, you know, we're rolling, you're climbing, you don't need to be that tight up on someone. And we're not really going that hard. I mean, for me, anyway. Right here, we're coasting. It's a pretty road. It's gonna go down and turn to the left. And on this road, you might get passed by a car every now and then. This is the going through the forest, Sam Houston National Forest, the outskirts of it. Bob rolls up. I slip behind him, get him on camera. So resist the urge to ride dress too skimpily because what will happen is instead of you having a great ride, your body will take energy to keep you warm. You want to dress properly. You need to put time into it. We think about it every time we step out the door. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. When it's summer, same thing. If it's hot, you got to lighten it up. The road's kind of gets chewed up here. At this point, I'm just reading the road. You don't want to wait for the warnings. Look ahead. Just like you would do if you were solo. There's too much going on in this section here. Too many holes for somebody to point out everything. So you need to look ahead and plan your line. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking where Doug is in the front. And before I get there, I already know where I'm going to track my bicycle. There's more on the left. I turned the camera, there's more right there. He was hanging out in the forest waiting on us. So his guys are up the road, he's come back, backtrack, to come and pull us back to his guy. Because when he comes back, he will keep edging the pace. He doesn't keep the pace steady, because he wants to get us up there. The only problem with that is some people fall off the pace again when he tries to pull us there. This is what I decided to use as a teaching moment. Some of the decisions that people make that, I, that just doesn't work consistently with what I know and what I was taught. Even though the road's chewed up, we're not slowing down, we're moving. So you have to keep your eyes up the road and be alert. So all we're doing is dodging all these imperfections in the road. There's more on the right. So right here, the impetus is on. The group's moving, you can't fall asleep. This is not the time to be cute. You gotta get up there, get in the draft. Leaving the forest and this road, Bethel Road, actually goes to the right. Turn the camera around. That's Bethel Road on the right, right there. We're not going that way. That goes south. That's the gorilla route we came on once before. 
we're going straight south and this road becomes FM 1097 on the western side. They've got two of them that, on the east side that goes north and south. Another quiet road that's well paved. Get a car now and then. This will take us into downtown Montgomery, Texas. So I'm sitting on Neville's wheel here. At this point, uh, that's more Mo's getting something to eat. I don't know if I got enough shots of him. Mo pulled over to the left. He dropped something. I think it must have been trash. But because you know when we eat, we put our wrappers in our jersey. He was trying to get food out. You have to be able to do hands-free. Now you notice he's doing hands-free. He's to the left of Rudy. Because if something happens with Rudy, he's got plenty of room. He's already checked for traffic. It's real quiet. That's why he's doing it here. So don't do hands free and be right behind the wheel you're drafting. Man, he's doing it when the wind is favorable. There's a lot of factors that go into it. I made a video about how to do hands free. It's a skill that you practice. You need to be able to do it. You shouldn't have to stop your bike to do minor things like take off your gloves, put them in your pocket, and yada, 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 the way you need to leave the bars. You should be able to do it. That's something you work on. It comes over time. I'm sitting to the left of Neville. That's where the best draft is. I don't know if I turned the camera around or not, but Scott is on my wheel at this point. Uh, Scott is the guy with the white vest that I told you all to keep track of. Uh, turn it around, you can't really see him. I'm turning around to balance the gimbal. At this point, the gimbal starts behaving really well. Temperature, you can see it says 11C, like uh, 52, 53 Fahrenheit, I estimate, something like that. So everything just is warmer, you know. Um, I'm looking and I see that gap in front of Mark. That tells me Mark's working a little hard. Mike is at the front pulling. And Mo is sitting in the wind. This, this pace is not hard for Mo. He came back to basically get us up to his group because they're up the road. Mike is pulling. And this road is up and down and it's exposed. So the wind's always here. You can hear it. We got a slight downhill and if you look ahead, you can see the rollers. That's why we love coming north. Paul and I ride, we head north. It takes us about 45 minutes or so if we come directly to, to get outside of town. And within two hours, we're out here. So two hours out here, then two and a half back. We loop, we do. This is what you, we do. Makes it hard. Look at that road. Beautiful. It's going up. So I'm just kind of soft pedaling at this point. Pick up my cadence here. That's Johnson Road we just passed. So these, we come to the same places, but we don't do the same routes the same way every time. That keeps the variety up. This road, this area has enough roads to ride that you don't have to do the same course too frequently. You do pieces of it, but it leads to new things. That's how we keep it fresh and challenging. It's going up here. It's probably three and a half percent when we're done. We're having to move a little more left of the white line. All the people are doing it because there is a rider that was on the right, I believe. I think it was Doug that was on the right. People go right or left depending on the yo-yo in effect so they don't have to touch their brakes. We rarely brake in the pace line. You don't want to do that. There's no reason that you have to. It's a tight pace line here. I'm sitting to the left of Neville. And then Mike has just pulled off. Now Mike is going to go behind Scott, who's behind me. I turned off all the background music here so you guys can feel and see 
the sensations of what was going on at this point in the ride it starts to get really hard we're riding at 42 kilometers an hour it's windy and it says 44 what I'm doing is I'm keeping my eye on Scott because he'd been back there before Mike came and a lot of times the last person in the group there's a reason they're back there they're not feeling that great they don't want to be in the middle and get tired and have to leave gaps for other people so I always keep my eye on the caboose of the group so to speak make sure we're together because the way I ride I'm back. is uh, and then you know I'm back there and I make sure I call that cars coming you heard me say that but the way I ride is that I want to make sure I must try to back off the pace a little bit so that the weakest person or, the, or whoever's tired can stay in versus going through an intersection and then stopping by the side of the road to wait oh, I thought Scott was back, back there my bad so Scott had been pulling I'm not sure why because he's gonna end up getting dropped so okay this makes sense now uh, he's right here I'm gonna ride up he's gonna drift back he's gonna get behind me because I believe Mike wants to be on his bars his arrow bars so I was the last guy in the group and that's another thing why did he have to pull Mo came back for us he should have just let Mo pull now Mo is at the front and Mo is gonna kick it up so now Scott has taken a long pull you remember we're doing 40 some kilometers look, look at Mike look at Mark working look at his body rocking all over look at that he sat up he do not like this effort And this is how when we used to race, this is what we would see. You can tell when people are getting weaker or putting out a lot of power. Especially uh, Mark, who's not really fit into his bike very well. He's all over his bike. It's hard here. And I'm looking behind to see, and these guys behind me are getting gapped. Never looked over because he felt me on his... I mean, I'm tight. I'm not wasting one ounce of watt if I don't have to. <laughs> so he, uh, he could feel me crowding him. I'm over the white line here and Mo has turned it up because he wants us to catch his guys he wants us to work harder Mo doesn't just give you the wheel he puts the wheel there and he checks if you're still there he starts edging up the effort so you're always working a little harder and this is a, I think this is a Strava segment there's a rule called Watson here well Strava segment yeah right right here I told them to back off we lost two so Mo didn't hear me he's way at the front these guys did so they're sitting up and now I'm waiting for I don't know if I turn the camera around Scott has gotten dropped but Scott let a, let a gap open so Mike was behind it so Scott and Mike have gotten dropped so I turn off the power to wait for them that's what you see here I know I can ride up to these guys and you're gonna see it in a little while we're gonna we're gonna drop the hammer but what I want you to follow is that I'm waiting for Scott who got dropped because he got dropped Mike got dropped this is Mike Mike came around me because Mike wouldn't have gotten dropped if Mike had been on my wheel but because Scott let a gap open and he was behind Scott he got dropped so he came around me once I, I, I slowed down and I'm still waiting for Scott because he ended up riding around Scott to come up here I'm still waiting for Scott Paul Ilunga has backed off the power to kind of wait up because he heard me say back off we got two off the back so Paul's here now watch what, what Scott's gonna do I've been waiting for Scott Scott's gonna come and go to the front which is what I want to point out don't do that you just got dropped why are you going to the front I'm explaining to Paul what I was calling out to them they're still riding more of them are still riding and that's fine now watch I put the arrow on Scott don't do that you just got dropped why are you going to the front he's gonna do this kind of stuff multiple times and I will point it out each time when I see him up there I'm like I got a big question mark because I'm like we've been waiting for you so we can pull you back you come to the front because he had made a comment that I don't need to work too hard on these hills I'm too far away from home that's what he told me right before he got dropped because I was back there you didn't hear it on the camera so I went ahead and got to the front. I said, okay, if you can pull, I'm going to go ahead and pull up to these boys now. We don't need to ride back here. So I dropped the hammer. 
Watch the speeds. Because my thing is, if you can pull, why did you get dropped? You should have used that effort to not get dropped. That's the teaching moment. Why get dropped and come to the front? Use that energy to stay with the group. We could have been up there with more than them. So next time, from what I saw that happen on this day, next time, I'm not calling out for this particular fellow because he needs to use his head. I'll do it for another person. That was his opportunity. Next time he gets dropped, I'm staying in the group. Because he came to the front and pulled, and you'll see another thing that he does when we get into town again. Which is what I decided, okay, if you're going to choose where you're going to work, then you need to be riding by yourself. Because we would have left him out on that highway if we had not backed off. So right now, I've rode up to the group. I can catch them. I'm waiting for the climb to catch them. I make a more ground, ground here as the road goes up. Right there. That's what I do. I like to catch people when the road goes up because we all got to put out the watts. There's no rolling, there's no drafting or whatever. And this is the way I get my workout too. So I'm riding fairly hard here to close this gap. But what I'm saying is, he should have used that energy that told him to come to the front. That he used to come to the front to stay with the group. But then he told me, oh, I don't want to work this hard way out here because I'm too far away from home. I, that didn't compute with me. If that's the case, then why are you coming around? And you will see he would do another thing on the hill when we get into town. So we complete the closing. <laughs> I guess never was surprised that we were there. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but then at this point, you can see more of them around that curve. They're, they're up, up the road. We could have been there. So I, I decided, okay, next time I will just keep riding unless it's somebody else because people need to learn, don't waste your energy. Why did you allow yourself to get dropped and then come and show us that you can ride at the front? I don't understand that. And then he, he does it again when we get in town. So I sit on the left here. We're, we're getting into Montgomery. The road goes up here, about two and a half percent, I think. So this area is farm country, it's unprotected. So with the rollers and the wind, a two and a half percent climb might feel like six percent. So you live in our area and you want to get strong, you need to ride north. This is where all the heavy hitters are. Because when, we, when I used to compete, we would drive to come and ride out here. We'd put our bikes in our cars. I lived on the southwest side where it's flat like a pancake. We'd drive north, park our car, and then ride to get hill work. That was the reason that when the opportunity came, I moved north. You see where I am? The wind's coming from the right and in our face. So I'm sitting right where there's a nice draft. The camera makes it seem really close, but I'm not overlapping. When they slow down, I don't break. I move out if it's safe. I move on the road and let the wind slow me down. Like right here with coasting. You can see I move left and let the wind slow me down. can't even see those guys now because we spent so much time waiting back there. They're out of sight around that hill. So when you see stuff like that, if you wait for somebody and then they come to the front, you're like, why did I have to wait? If you can come to the front, you should have worked your butt off to stay with the group. So yes, people can ride for years and have no understanding about what to really do in the group and how to conserve the energy and when to work and when not to work. As a racer, that's the first thing you're taught. You hook up with a group, your goal is, first of all, stay with the group till the end. That's your goal, nothing else. Once you can comfortably do that, 
Then you start taking little polls and trying other stuff. You don't go to the front of the group and then get dropped. And other people got to wait for you. There are a lot of groups we used to ride with. You get dropped, you're on your own, you will never see them again. <laughs> you're on your own. Those are open rides. They might tell you no drop ride, but that's just a saying. You get dropped, you better have a map. So you learn real quickly to use your energy wisely. You're going to see what I'm talking about here. When we go around, we're, we're, in, we're coming into town now. The boys are up the road waiting for us. Because we lost them in these curves and hills. So Mark's going to ask. Yeah. I'm telling Paul the camera's behaving. Now you can turn. We're laughing because Mark is asking whether we got everybody. I said, oh, now you can turn. I was yelling back there to let you guys know you were dropping people. Nobody said anything. So then he said it was Mo. I said, well, you don't have to follow Mo if you want to keep your group together. You didn't make a plan with Mo. You can't come out on the road and change your plan. Stick with what you did. So I, I just rolled to the front. And we're going in the, in the city. And then Mark's going to ask whether we need to stop. And I'm like, my bottle's full. I feel like somebody needs to pee. I don't like too many stops. So it's like, I'm like, unless somebody needs to pee, we don't need to stop. Right there. Look at Scott. This is the guy who was dropped. Now he's going up the hill like we're standing still. So why didn't he use that energy to not get dropped? That's the point I was making. So next time he's getting dropped, we ain't going to look back. He's going to get dropped. So we can stay with the group because it's like we, if you had that much energy back there you should have worked to stay with the group so because of him we let the group go now he comes and he's riding off the front and you would see him do it again at the next light and so the group ended up waiting after this light you will see them and those are the things you kind of look at. I'm just pointing it out on this video because not everybody's going to point that out to you. You do something like that, you will get one shot at it. The next time, you will be out there by yourself because you're not using your head. Let's go. Use your energy to stay with the group. Don't be cute when the group going slow. They want look at him riding off the front. So you got all that energy. Why, why would you drop back there? That's why, you know, we kind of smile and we'll, so when somebody uh, says that you're posing, that's what they mean. When it got really hard, you would drop. When it's easy, then you're off the front. I mean, really? So next time, why should people wait? Yeah, here are more of them waiting for us because of him. But he's riding off the front like he brought us to them. That's what we call posing. Because it's not, whether it's intentional or not, he's not aware of, of what the nuances are. So you get one shot at that. The way we were, as racers, the way I was coached, you get one shot. The next time you do it, people will remember. It will let you learn the hard way. So now he went through the light. We're here caught at the light. And he's riding up the climb like the champion of Montgomery. It's the temperature, I guess so. So next time, yeah, he's going to be riding off the back by himself, and we're going to keep the pace high like it was back there. Quite a bit. That should get us to Keenan caught up now. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're really tired and you're falling off the pace and people wait for you, you come in, you sit in a draft and rest and catch your energy so that you can stay with the group. So you have all that energy and you intentionally let the group go and we had to wait for you. So next time we're not going to do it. <laughs> As Mo says, cycling time is precious. In a little while after the credits, you will see here, this is a Strava segment at Klon. Uh, Jerry goes for the Strava segment and he goes really hard and then Mo goes after Jerry's done doing the segment Mo says you guys want me to catch him and drop him and Paul said yeah go for it 
and Mo takes off up the climb. We're still climbing. He takes off up the climb like we're going, like he was going down. It just makes it look. That's Jerry. Jerry's going for the Strava segment. He's trying, but it's so windy. He said he didn't get. He didn't improve his time. The segments from there to he knows where it is. I don't know these segments. I'm not into that. So any kind of PRs or whatever you see on Strava when I load my ride, that's it's just there because it's on the route. I'm not going for anything. We just ride. So Jerry went really hard. So Mo takes off. Now watch. Then he goes again. And this is a climb, guys. You know. So you gotta ride lots. That's what it takes. What you're seeing is achievable. You can do it. You just gotta get off your butt and get out there. And the things I'm pointing out here are things you need to be aware of. Learn how to use your energy wisely. Don't put on a show. Get your K's in. 